Today, I want to talk about reframing how we're thinking about our coast. <clears throat> We've not yet had our lecture on the definition of what is the coast, but the based on our discussions on <clears throat> uh, Monday on the last lecture, I decided it would be helpful to, to pick a topic that might allow us to think of some non-traditional uh, things about the coast. So this is uh, a word cloud of the, the single word that people most associated with the, the coast um, from a previous class, in this case, 2018. And you'll see that beach and surf are by far the most uh, common terms and other things, Godzilla and refreshing and other things are, are not very um, common. Here is uh, the results from this fall of 2021. And uh, now I use a different uh, word cloud generator, but uh, so the smallest words are a little bit bigger, but relatively speaking, you get the same outcome. You get waves and beach and, and surf, and then the rest of the stuff, tuna, peaceful, uh, calm, those things are uh, much less common. And so our views of what we think of as the coast are dominated by the skin of the ocean and by um, beaches. It's important to think about the different types of uh, I, uh, things that our, our, our coast and ocean offers us. This is Maybe we first glance at it and we're thinking this is a little pool by an intertidal area or whatever. In fact, this is actually an underwater chunk of land. Uh, uh, well, not an underwater chunk of the ocean, I should say. And so as we look at this, we're looking through water to a really dense layer of, of super salty water as well. So it looks as if we're looking through air onto water. We're actually looking through water onto water. So there's all kinds of fantastically neat things in the coastal zone, some of which are just pure awesome physics. The coastal zone though also includes the terrestrial side of things. So in this case, this, this is a, uh, a coastal prairie, you know, this woodland, this prairie, these are absolutely part of coastal. This guy, a vampire tooth, this is a, 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 a small, this guy's only about a two, couple, uh, couple inches long, but this um, really cool uh, deep sea midwater um, squid is really awesome, is optically black. It has red, but we don't have the flashes from the cameras from the robots taking pictures. Um, you cannot see this because red, the red color disappears really, red wavelength of light drops out very quickly in water. Um, so all kinds of neat, crazy, cool um, critters are found across the coastal zone like this guy. Um, this lady's quinceanera. So if we look at this, the, the area behind her, some of that um, nave is made of coral, some of it is made of quarried stone, some of it is made of adobe, some of it is made with clay brick. Um, all of this stuff comes from the coastal zone. Now we do have some of this stuff like you can quarry rocks and you can have adobe from inland areas as well. But, but in this case, um, you know, it's really important and it's really important to talk about how the physical lay of the land and of the sea um, influences our culture and the importance of this that we have personally to our lives and our families, etc. You guys are all coastal. You're all coastal. Now, so um, this would this this is the result from um, fall 2018 when I asked you uh, what were you born in a coastal county? Did you grow up in a coastal county? And back then, 78% were born, 100% grew up in a coastal county. In fall 2020, 92% were born in a co coastal county. 96% of you grew up in coastal. This year, um, you're a bit lower, but still, the vast majority of you were born in a coastal county. The vast majority of you grew up in a coastal county. So you are coastal. Coastal uh, also implies a dynamic uh, systems. So this is Mayor... Eric Garcetti from Los Angeles, and he's paddling on the Los Angeles River, a place that we typically associate with destruction and, and alteration and channelization. But in fact, we do still have some stretches of the LA River. And several of the organizations that I work with have, have been working for some time and are working over the next 50 years to restore, rewild, get rid of the concrete on the Los Angeles River and restore some of that dynamism back to this area. So right now, at the end of summer, um, you can, well, we're, 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 the, the bookings are, are closing up now, but, but um, in the spring to, to late summer, you can next year book a, a paddling trip down, in this case, this is the Sepulveda Basin area of, um, of Los Angeles, but, but you can 
um, you know, you can paddle the LA River. You can come check out some of these last uh, assemblages of of nature that we are in the process of trying to expand greatly and increase that function. We're trying to return more dynamism to this part of the coastal zone. Um, and then, as with all of our other environmental challenges, the threats are never um, are never ceasing. So, uh, President um, um, Biden has not released a specific plan yet, so we can't compare his. But but we can look at the last several presidents as an example. The second President Bush was interested in in o offshore oil drilling off of Alaska and um, off the Gulf Coast primarily. Uh, President Obama greatly reduced the the interest in opening new um, leases to only a small, tiny area off Alaska and then the, the Gulf oil fields. Um, President Trump basically said, we're going to drill everywhere, except for when his friends said, actually, we don't want you to. And then he started doing things like pulling Florida out. But, but um, basically, just evidence that um, we might think something is conserved, something is protected, something is well-functioning, but there are always ongoing efforts to to modify and degrade these systems. Uh, this is an image from uh, Thomas Cole. We talked about uh, in, a, in a previous uh, discussion, we talked about symbolism and the, and the power of symbolism. This is part of a, a series of paintings he did to depict the Roman Empire. And in this case, he's depicting the fall of the Roman Empire. And we see, uh, you know, statues with their heads off and people being violent and stuff's on fire and everything. But he also very intentionally created this, this typhoon, this ocean storm, this gray sky there is there by, by intent with the idea that this storm is coming ashore and the storm is threatening. So, so the coast can also be quite dangerous. The co coast can also be uncertain and scary. Uh, and we've seen some of the consequences of that, that we've actually intensified the scariness and the weirdness. This is Houston in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. Um, at the time, this was this set the record. I believe it still might hold it. Set the record for the heaviest rainfall in the lower 48 states in a 24-hour period. Insane amounts of rainfall. Where these people are walking should not necessarily be flooded, but because of the decisions that we took to modify the hydrology in this coastal zone, um, this made these people and these people's homes more vulnerable to intensive flooding, particularly in low-income areas. And then last year, um, we we just discussed Ida, Hurricane Ida, um, in class this week. But um, last year it was Hurricane Laura, and she came up while Ida went up the the east side of Louisiana near New Orleans. This uh, hurricane struck on the west side near the Texas border, and in this case, this is Lake Charles. And what we're looking at is a, is a essentially a chlorine a chemical plant that has been damaged and has caught fire, and we're seeing chlorine. Um, burning up. And so I would posit to you that that is not a sustainable solution and that we need real objectivity when we talk about the coast and don't get trapped into only thinking about the coast and its challenges and its needs as the beach, as the ocean waves. Now, uh, I've not comp <clears throat> compiled your uh, group feedback from the other day, but this is some these are the results from 2018. They show a similar pattern. What I want to talk about here for the rest of the lab is just the things, uh, the types of things that, that you all thought were generally positive about the coast included things such as recreation and awareness of the environment, all that kind of good stuff. So we'll take that as our cue. Um, and before we do that, I'll, I'll just, I just want to make sure that I, I note that um, culture and ecosystems are directly coupled. So on the right there, that's my uh, grandma um, in Hawaii, uh, just uh, around the time of World War II. And um, uh how she saw the world was influenced by nature and in turn uh, her her Hawaiian heritage and culture and all this great stuff. So there's there's always a feedback here in these systems. And we should be really careful not to get too much thinking only about culture or only about uh, the biological, physical, abiotic world. It really is. These things really are coupled. Okay, so... Thinking about the coast, today's activity, we're going to uh, try to bring some fresh eyes. And so I've decided to pick a different um, project that maybe we're not familiar with. And that is this idea of um, a charismatic megafauna. So let's let's just remind ourselves that many of these um, uh, uh, critters are quite um, attractive to the general public. And so these, this is a little compilation I made just to show some examples of... Researchers at Cal State Long Beach are using... Of... Um, 
of events and organisms that really captured the public attention that went viral. They got super well covered in, in national or international media. So we'll just watch this for a minute. Drones and acoust acoustic transmitters to track great white sharks off the Southern California coast. New studies show that rather than being rare visitors, these predators share the sea with swimmers and surfers on a daily basis. Researchers at the university's shark lab are studying when and where white sharks appear and what circumstances lead to attacks, including temperature, prey availability, and other environmental factors. The ultimate goal? being to improve beach safety. Yeah, the more we know, the better off we'll all be. New at 11, despite an intense firefight in Cherry Valley, Orange County firefighters took the time to rescue a lost dog from the fire. It's unclear how the dog ended up along the fire lines, but soon after it was spotted, firefighters tended to that dog, gave him water, and a bite of their sandwich, and carried him down to safety. They called out animal control to care for the dog while they continued to fight the fire. This is some video <clears throat> of some fishermen who were out fishing. They had some drones. They noticed these humpbacks were going by as a, a, a mother, a cow, and a calf. And then this pod of orcas came up and started attacking them. So this video is, is quite long. We don't have to watch the whole thing. But suffice it to say, these orcas start going after the calf. The mom's defending um, you know, her child and... I'm keeping them away, but this goes on for some time. And after several hours, she she um, just can't uh, can't keep them away, and they end up getting the calf, drowning the calf, and uh, uh, killing the calf. Um, and this was a hugely uh, 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 this was all over the place in terms of the media. And so you can choose to watch that if you want later. I'll put the full I'll, I'll put the the video in our um, link. <laughs> This is a um, it was on the, the east coast, southeast coast, in South Carolina, and uh, you know huge amount of likes. So in this case, this this hawk had grabbed this fish, and people were like, okay, whatever. And then the fish was like, hey, I'm not dead yet. Let me go. Let me go. And people really seemed to take uh, there you go. People really took the sort of inspiration of, uh, by that, like not giving up. This was um, off of uh, Southern California coast, and this is. Um, a critter that should be <laughs> should be up in the polar waters, but this beluga whale um, was, for inexplicable reasons, in 2020 down off of our coast and stood there. Well, it stayed there for a while, so many different whale watching boats and recreational vessels saw this individual. Very easy to see, very stark. Uh, so a two-year-old could tell this is uh, something cool and something unusual. So all these cases are examples of of charismatic megafauna researchers charismatic megafauna and um and just show that they um can sometimes lead us to conversations with the public that maybe just a regular lecture or an informational slideshow or some something else might not <clears throat> might not get the um the attention and so if we're smart about this we can use these um uh, these charismatic megafauna to educate the public and hopefully uh, work towards better management. And so we're going to go to Hawaii now for the rest of our lab. And we're going to talk about manta ray ecotourism as, as one type of, of management issue in, in the coast and one type of one category of thing we might want to be thinking about when we talk about coastal issues. And so in this case, uh, uh, this is uh, manta rays, big giant um, uh, cartilaginous fishes related to skates and uh, sharks. These guys are um, uh, planktivorous, that they feed off plankton, and they, they swim around, they can't bite you, they just filter feed the water column, little critters out of the, out of the water column to eat, um, and that's how they make their living. Uh, starting about 20 years ago, um, people, this is, this is this, you know, these guys have been doing this forever, but, um, you know, people started noticing many decades ago that if uh, if you have a bright light um, shining uh, in the water, that will attract, uh, or that can attract f a po a f positively phototactic plankton. So plankton that are swimming towards the light. So they, they, they will concentrate in the light. And because these manta rays like to feed off of plankton, um, people figured out that, oh, these things are attractive. And about 20 years ago, um, a commercial uh, 
for-profit industry started to spin up around this idea and get more and more mature, especially over the last decade. Um, in particular, we're talking here about the uh, uh, Kailua Kona area of the Big Island of Hawaii. And that's where this image is taken. And so what's, what's happened now is we've seen several, you know, lots and lots of boats uh, come into the, the, the um, space here. Now, this is very close to land. This is probably only about, I don't know, 50 feet, 100 feet from, from the edge of the beach or so. Water's, you know, on the order of 20 to 30 feet. So it's very shallow, sandy bottom. And this, all these boats have giant lights. And so some people are snorkeling, some people are scuba diving, but they are, they are uh, going, they're paid tourists. They're paying these vendors, take them out there very close to the harbor. So it's a very short ride, um, get in the water and then check out the mantas. The cool thing is people that scuba dive go down to the bottom and kneel on the sand and stay down there and look up at the manta rays as they, as they swim into these pools of light to feed. People that aren't great scuba divers um, can, um, or, or just don't want to, can be snorkelers. And you're seeing that uh, here in both these images where they're on the surface looking down. And then folks that are um, maybe not swimmers or don't, don't feel comfortable being in the water at night, that kind of thing, they can stay on the boat. And indeed, some of the boats have uh, glass bottom holes so you can actually look down. So you could be a non-swimmer, a minimal swimmer, a floater, or a scuba diver and have still a really amazingly close visit with these um, incredible creatures, these manta rays. So a couple of years ago, I took our class to Hawaii and we looked at this as one of the things we did. So this is looking off of the Sheridan. This is this is from this uh, a, a big, uh, classic, fancy Hawaiian hotel. Um, and I'm looking, I'm standing on the edge of the beach and looking straight out. You can see right there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, boats just, just glancing there. And then spin around and we have the high-end restaurant right there. So they're very, very close into shore. And then this is uh, a brief video. <clears throat> this is from uh, a gentleman from the tourism uh, board, uh, again, in the, on the big island of Hawaii. And we were talking to him, and this is an excerpt. Um, this is an excerpt uh, from his, his uh, presentation to us, but specifically about um, the manta uh, tourism, ecotourism around manta rays. And so he's going to talk about his experience and then what's going on. And at one point he'll mention, he'll make reference to the tall, other, other uh, tourism efforts um, that are based in uh, on the big tall mountain that's on the island uh, where there's a, a cool summit and and snow and things of that nature. So, so let's hear what we have to say about manta rays. So it started in the 80s? Actually, because I don't remember it. No, back then. it wasn't until it wasn't until 2000s that they actually started doing it as a tour. Yeah. Because anybody could hop in the water anytime on their own and do it. And what I, what I had done, and this is my example of it, is in the early 90s when I moved to the island myself, I'm in my early 20s, and I had no money. They didn't do any tours. So I would go up to a place called Mahu Kona, which is where Kauai High is at the corner of Kohala there, and you go towards Hapi a little ways. It's just a small boat harbor that has a single street lamp above the ramp and my buddies and I would just grab a cooler, a bunch of beers, throw our snorkel on or our fins, hop in and we're just sitting there and the mantas are all around us and we would just do that all the time and that just that's just what you did. Nobody ever was going to make a tour out of it but that's when when the numbers really started booming in 2000 to 2005 and then beyond then more and more companies decided they could get, you know what, I could make a tour out of this thing. You know what, I could make some money. People would pay. Or actually what happens is a guy would volunteer his boat and meet some tourists and say, you know what, come out with me. We're going to go check out the man. Let's just hop on the boat. We'll go for a nice night and experience it. No cost. They just did it because that's the way the locals would be. Then the tourists that were with them would say, you know what, you could charge for this. And that's how the cycle all starts, is that someone says, you know what, I could charge for this. I can get this much money. You know what, I'm going to get a bigger boat. And then it just cycles from there, and it goes out. See, I never told anybody we was used to go to Mahu Kona. You can just jump in right there. <laughs> so how, how, many, how, many, how, many, how many 
boats are now doing? Is it like dozens? Is it like, you know? There's at least, and, and the way we work as well is we try to, to take the cream of the crop or the legitimate companies that have been doing it for a long time. promote them. Who, yeah, and that's mm -hmm. who we, we work with for a long time. Um, there's probably at least 16 tours that go right to the Sheraton area. There's some others that go right outside here by the airport. Mm -hmm. This is a great spot out here as well. Um, one of the things with the Mana Dive was great is you can take the entire family. You can take the extended family. If you're a certified diver, you can get in and down. If you're not, you can snorkel and sit right on top. And if you're not even that excited, you can sit in the boat and still get a similar experience. So any level can experience the Mantis to whatever extent you're comfortable. It, it is. It's just, it's grown immensely to where they're looking at putting some type of restrictions on it. They is the state? The, the Department of Land and Natural Resources um, and the Harbors Division as well. So to make sure that the boats match up with the tours and everything's legitimate. And kind of what they did with Mauna Kea Summit. Mauna Kea Summit in the 1970s, you could do tours back then mm. up to the summit. Mm. Now they're restricted to eight tour companies that can bring 24 people every night. So that's the number. You know you're going to have a cap. There aren't many people that drive up there themselves to go to the to the visitor center and check out, but they don't go to the summit um, unless you have a four-wheel drive, and then there are many of those that go up there beyond that. But that same type of restriction is what they're looking for. The command is, is okay. We can only take ten boats tonight, and each boat can only have this many bodies on it. And I don't think it has done anything to the mantis themselves, because I think putting the lights out there creates the food source for them, and that's why they come in, and that's why they do it. They're not running away from the people; they're actually coming towards them. It's there's, yeah. There's always two sides of the story, and, and we're finding the same thing with the dolphins as well. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So that was a little bit about the the history of, of um, the development of manta ray uh, night uh, tourism, ecotourism off the Big Island. So um, our question: uh, We had a discussion in class a bit ago about uh, w what might be the benefits in the in the costs related to um, uh, this type of tourism, and uh, we discussed several different examples from. Some people are worried that we'd be depleting the plankton or somehow habituating the, the critters. Um, uh, those probably aren't real concerns in this in this case. Um, other concerns about uh, where the money is going to. So clearly the money here is going to small business owners, which is good, but not necessarily um, folks that have lived in the community their whole lives. Uh, sometimes, yes, but... but uh, so, so all those issues are still uh, alive and well. But to start our conversation, we'd like to figure out, and the purpose of today's lab is, <clears throat> is manta tourism beneficial? So let's let's uh, figure out how we might um, look at that. <clears throat> as I said, there's some potential downsides, uh, such as this, this highly developed high-end, uh, or, or it taking place near this high-end uh, resort type of complex, which which raises questions of accessibility and access and and, and stuff. Um, and then uh, on the bottom, there is, you know, there is sometimes risk to the critters if uh, people are not behaving properly. And again, that's the worry as these, these become more and more crowded with <clears throat> operators. So this is an individual that uh, on the bottom here that uh, was whacked uh, by people. Unclear if it was propeller scars or if it was, say, the ropes that we use to pull things in, maybe dragged across the you know the skin, but but in any event, you know, we we can clearly have some negative impacts if we if we're not uh, careful. Um, again, where we're talking about is on the Kailua Kona coast, so this area on the Big Island of Hawaii. And and our the focus for our lab activity here uh, to start us off is um, how much you know. So, so okay, so there, there's benefits and costs. Let's get a sense of what we're talking about in terms of the revenue brought to the community. So how much revenue uh, potentially is being generated? Now we're not gonna, we're not asking people for their ledgers here, but we're just trying to get a ballpark estimate of what the amount of money coming in could look like. 
So we're going to do that by collecting info on uh, every, every individual is going to collect uh, some info on two, basically profile two different Manta businesses in the Kona Kalua area. Assuming there's enough, we might run out. We might have to look include some businesses from elsewhere, but we want to focus on that area to start. Um, we have this communal Google Sheet that you can um, uh, go to and, and, and check out and begin to add to. So let's take a look at that Google Sheet right now. So here we go. So the, here's our sheet. And so how this is going to work is everybody has been assigned a line. So there's there's two lines for each of us. And you're just going to go and on the bottom here, now many students have already filled this out. Or we, we've already gone through the lab. Most of us have. So uh, ones that are crossed out are already taken. But these were the names of some um, shops that uh, at least relatively recently existed. We didn't, I don't know if they're all in operation, but so the students were checking them out. So you can check out those few last ones that aren't crossed out. Maybe they're still you can get, or just simply Google it. The only requirement though, is that you must first check and make sure that no one else has already done that business. The business can only be done once. Okay, so when so let's assume you you've you've Googled or found your your uh, site. So um, you'll go to your line. You'll put the name of the business there. You'll put the the link to the to the business, and then you just want to make sure it's in this 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 uh, focal region of the Big Island that we're talking about. So yes, and then uh, for Target, just to give us some concreteness, I want you to look for availability of um, tours the week of September thirteenth, and so. And just, and just tell us if there's, you know, a lot, a little, none, some, you know, just qualitatively. Don't, don't spend a lot of time on this. Just, just a quick overview. And then we want to know the price for uh, a snorkel, a, a snorkel experience, a night snorkel, and the price for a scuba um, experience, assuming they have both. If they only have one or the other, you can just list one. But, but uh, tell us what that is. And then how many hours the experience is going to last for. Is this an hour long thing? Is this a two hour long thing? A five hour long thing? What have you. Uh, and, and approximately how many people or the maximum number of people that are that can be on the boat. And so that's going to give us a sense of we are we talking about you know you, me and one other person or is this a group of you know 40 people type of deal? Um, and then uh, we'd really we'd like to know while it's not necessary, if you've gotten everything else off the website, that's fine. but if you, if you need to get some more details, um, you know it's okay to, to give these guys a ring and ask some of these some back background questions. Um, you know, as, as we compare these different opportunities, people do this all the time when they're, when they're trying to figure out which, which operator to go with. So it's, it's all good. We don't want to bother these folks, but, but a quick, uh, you know, minute or two call is not, should not be a problem. Um, but if, if you do make a phone call, do me a favor and ask these folks how their business is doing in this time of COVID. So, so are they finding that this summer their business was low compared to the historic? Is it about what it was in the past or is it, um, better than in the past? And so, um, again, not required to do our back of the envelope calculation, but it would be interesting to know for our conversations this semester in terms of impacts on the coastal zone of COVID, et cetera. So that's it. So you're going to do all this. Please have this done by um, our Friday 5 p.m. deadline time. So that's when I'll be going in. Uh, do it as soon as you can, please. But, but definitely uh, no later than 5 p.m. on Friday. And I'll go in and, and assess and look at things at that point. So with that, that's our lab for the week. Dig into it. Let me know if you guys have any questions and I will talk to you all soon. Stay safe, wash your hands and wear your mask.